next up, Marcus is going to tell us how to uh, connect up uh, eGraphs and Lean for the purposes of uh, proofs. So take it away when you're ready. Okay. Is this on? Uh, chime it. Uh, okay. So uh, I think we have a very unique audience today here because half of you are probably jet lagged. The other half has just cram packed their brain with content in the last seven hours. And we're all still uh, coping with Philip's uh, mind chattering talk this morning. Uh, so what I hope to do in this talk is to give a really uh, simple talk to give you some space to breathe, basically. And so I only want to talk about uh, two things, really. So first, there's uh, eGraphs, which all of you already know, which is great. And then there's the world of interactive theorem provers, uh, of which Lean is uh, one representative. And what we want to do in this talk is to build a bridge between these two worlds, and uh, I hope to convince you that that's actually a, a good idea. So to get started, uh, since maybe not all of you have a background on interactive theorem provers, uh, I'll just quickly motivate what they are, and that's also quite naturally uh, going to lead us to, um, to figuring out why we might want to connect them to eGraphs. So you may have seen some of these names before, like Lean is a theorem prover, uh, Adrian just talked about Koch, um, and what these systems really are at a high level uh, are systems in which you can express basically arbitrary mathematical definitions and theorems and proofs. And if you do that, what these systems give you in return is uh, a correctness check, basically. So they tell you whether what you wrote actually makes sense or it does not. So for definitions and theorems, that's kind of like what a compiler might do. It might tell you if you constructed a uh, ill-typed expression. Uh, but what interactive theorem provers uh, can do specifically is also uh, check your proofs down to the axioms of some foundation of mathematics. So naturally, since these systems are extremely expressive, people have used them to formalize and verify a bunch of different things. So uh, we've seen, have we seen hardware stuff? Yeah. Uh, for example, in this world of software verification, Coq is pretty, uh, pretty dominant. So you may have heard of the COMC C compiler, which is in part verified by Coq. And for example, more recently in the Lean Theorem Prover, uh, people have started to push to formalize and verify research level mathematics. And so seeing as these systems are very expressive and you can apparently do a lot of things in them, there must be some catch, right? And there always is, of course, a catch, namely that uh, proving things in these systems is uh, really tedious, which I hope you also saw like two talks ago when Adrian was talking about the prob uh, problems that they ran into when proving things in these systems. So. Uh, this is the point where I wanted to give a demo, but 25 minutes isn't that much time. Uh, so what I want to do instead is show you uh, an example of how proofs are really tedious in these systems by showing some lean code. So obviously you don't have to understand all the details uh, that you see here, but the important point is like on the first line, uh, we are 
defining a theorem statement. Namely, we're saying for all lists A's and B's, if we append A's and B's and we reverse the result, then that's the same as just reversing B's and appending the reverse of A's. Pretty standard theorem uh, for uh, functional programming. And the way we prove this in an interactive theorem prover is by using what is known as proof tactics. So for example, here we decide to prove this theorem by induction on the first list. And so this induction thing is what we would call a proof tactic. And it helps us somehow convince Lean that the statement, uh, that we can prove this statement. Now you can see that induces two subproofs here. First we have the case where the list is empty and then we have the inductive step. And in both cases, what we do to solve these subproofs is to use equational reasoning. And I think it's very explicit on the slide what the rec uh, equational reasoning steps are because we're using this calc tactic which allows you to kind of explicitly state the steps that you want to take. And so for example here in the nil case, one of the steps that we're taking uh, is to show that if we have the reversal of the list called b's, then that's the same as the reversal of b's appended to the empty list. Obviously it should be true, but we still have to convince Lean that that's actually true, and the way we do that is by again using a tactic called rewrite, uh, to which we pass this lemma called append nil, uh, which presumably tells us that a list is equal to appending the empty list to it. Okay, so this is what a, let's say, very normal proof in Lean would look like. You can see it's just absolutely tedious. Like, you're not doing research level math at this level of reasoning, right? We need something which is, uh, at a much higher level. So that's kind of the problem that we're facing with interactive theorem provers right now. Uh, proofs are really slow, and we'd like some tactics which are actually a bit faster and maybe even fun to use. There we go. And so as you might guess from me being at this workshop, we think a really reasonable tool to get there is uh, equality saturation. And this is the point where I need uh, the audience to participate, so maybe by a show of hands, uh, who of you was here two years ago at this workshop? Okay, a couple, not too many, okay, good. So for those of you who were here, you might find this familiar, and that's because two years ago, uh, Andres, who now is also, uh, yeah, still continuing on this work, uh, together with uh, Siddharth, already introduced an equality saturation proof tactic for Lean. And, the, so this is basically the spiritual successor uh, to, to that talk and to that work. And to kind of explain to you why we need to continue on that work, um, I'll start by showing you how their tactic basically worked and then also what was, uh, wh or which challenges uh, they ran into and how we maybe solve those uh, in our current tactic. Okay, so this is an overview of how the equality saturation proof tactic uh, works at a very high level. So you start with a, when you call a proof tactic, you start with a proof goal, and you also pass to that tactic a set of equations, which you might call rewrites. And then the first step that we take in this tactic is to somehow encode this proof problem into a problem which egg can understand. So as you can see, we use egg as our backend equality saturation solver. And once we've somehow encoded this problem into egg, uh, we run equality saturation. And what we get out of that, crucially, is an explanation. So some sort of proof witness. Because uh, just like in Koch, uh, we somehow now have to convince Lean that the proof that we found is actually correct. Uh, Lean is not gonna be satisfied with us telling it, well, egg found a proof, so everything's fine. No, we have to actually reconstruct a proof. So that's kind of the basically last step in this, whole, uh, in this whole process. We take the explanation produced by egg, we turn it into a proof in lean, and then we're basically done. Okay, so that's at a high level, that's how we do things. And now the work done by Andres and Siddharth, the, the proof of concept is really a proof of concept because especially this encoding step uh, was, yeah, it was a proof of concept. They, they tried if it worked and it worked some of the times and other times it didn't. Um, which effectively means the tactic works sometimes, but most of the time it just doesn't. And so this is what we want to pr improve upon uh, in this work. And to kind of explain to you what's hard about encoding a problem into egg and what we can improve upon, uh, I want to show you a simple example. Okay, uh, uh, show you a simple example uh, which uh, comes from the slide of lean code that I showed you earlier. So. 
uh, in the proof that I showed you from Lean, uh, there was one step which we talked about, which was uh, given the expression at the top, we wanted to prove that it's equal to the expression at the bottom. And we used that, or we did that using the lemma, which was I think called append nil, uh, whose statement is shown uh, at the arrow here. So the way we now uh, use egg to solve these kinds of problems is at a high level pretty simple. We just take both of these expressions, so the top expression uh, and the bottom expression, we stick them into the e-graph, we run equality saturation with a given rewrite, and then once those expressions merge into the same e-class, then we know that we've proven that, uh, that they're uh, equivalent. Uh, but now that of course begs the question like how do we actually take these expressions and put them in the e-graph? Because if you recall, like for example in egg you need some sort of uh, term language w in which you can express things. So in this case we need to choose how we represent our expressions. And the way we do it, for example, for the top expression is like this, which of course looks beautiful. Um, and I've color-coded some parts here so you can kind of make sense of this. So for example, the gray part is actually the call to the reverse function, the red part is the empty list, and this big blue part is this append operator. Um, and you can see this expression language that uh, Lean uses uh, seems to have a bunch of powerful constructs. So for example, type class instances and name definitions like list.nil and function application and free variables, and now maybe there's a bell ringing for some of you, this looks kind of familiar, and of course it's a lambda calculus, yeah. So in lean, every expression is lowered, or we would say elaborated, down to a expression of a specific lambda calculus, which then makes expressions look like this. And the fun part about lambda calculus is always that it brings with it a lot of problems. So we, <laughs> we ran into two problems uh, when encoding uh, these lambda calculus lean expressions into e-graphs, namely one is definitional equality, which is what I want to talk about most. And then if we have time, if I talk fast enough, I guess, uh, then we can also talk a bit about using binders in e-graphs because that's also uh, always fun. Uh, so let's start with talking about what definitional equality is and which problems arise from it when we want to solve uh, equality goals in egg based on lean expressions. So let's go back to our example. Uh, and let's actually now try to kind of run this rewrite step in an e-graph. So as previously mentioned, the first step that we have to take is uh, to encode both of the expressions, so the top and the bottom one, in this underlying lambda calculus, and then we would add these expressions to an e-graph. Now then if we want to run equality saturation, of course we need some set of rewrites. So this theorem here, this lemma, would turn into a rewrite, and that's quite natural to do as well. And uh, I've again kind of color-coded things here so you can kind of mentally match up uh, how this rewrite should apply to the top term. So for example, again, the red part is the empty list, and the orange part uh, corresponds to the quantified variable, so, so the list, and that should match against the list in the top expression. And now if you really squint your eyes, you might be able to see that this blue expression here, so this list append function, totally somehow doesn't match the blue expression on the top. So turns out you can see that in this rewrite rule, or in this, actually in this equation rather, in this theorem, I stated the append function using the list.append function. And in the top there, I used this plus plus operator, but as a lean user, I know that actually corresponds to the list append function. So that's, you know, that's just a difference in syntax, like how could that be a problem? But as it turns out, well it is a problem because now the way lean encodes this plus plus operator is by using this big blue expression, whereas it encodes this, yeah, let's say more foundational list depend function just really simply uh, by using a global constant. So as a result, uh, this rewrite just won't apply. So if we try to solve this problem in an e-graph by encoding just these lean expressions directly into the e-graph, it's just not gonna work. Uh, what's interesting though now, if I would ask lean to kind of apply this theorem to the top expression, it would totally work. Because lean seems to understand that this append function and this plus plus operator are actually the same thing. And the reason that Lean understands this is that it, its notion of equality isn't just syntactic equality, 
uh, but instead it's definitional equality. So to show you what definitional equality is in Lean, let's kind of just zoom, on, on, uh, zoom in on these two expressions. And if I now ask Lean, are these two expressions the same thing, then it's going to say, totally, they are definitionally equal because I can find this set of uh, expressions where each expression is related to the one above and below by a definitional equality rule. And if I transitively chain together definitional equality rules, uh, rules, then I still have definitionally equal expressions. So as far as Lena is concerned, this top and this bottom expression just are the same, and I don't need to prove that, uh, need to prove that they're equal. They're just kind of judgmentally equal. And so these definitional equality rules um, come in all shapes and, and forms. So for example, in, in this specific set of transformations, we use, for example, delta reduction, which and I guess my headphones just connected, <laughs> okay. Um, we use delta reduction, uh, which states that a definition is equal to unfolding that definition, which I hope makes kind of intuitive sense why you would want that as an inbuilt part of equality. And one that you might be more familiar with, which we use here is eta reduction, which is used, for example, here on this line. Whoops, uh, but on the line where my cursor is. Uh, where we use eta reduction to show that this expression is e definitionally equal to the next one because we can just remove this unnecessary binder here. So there exists a ton of definitional equality rules which lead to a difference in what Lean understands as equality and what Egg understands as equality. Namely, Lean has these associated semantics uh, with its, or for its notion of equality, whereas e-graphs only work uh, syntactically. And as we've seen before, that leads to problems. So for example, we saw that this can mean that rewrites just do not apply because they only match definitionally, but not syntactically. And also sometimes if we rewrite in an e-graph, uh, then egg is gonna saturate at some point and say that it wasn't able to prove the goal, even though, um, or just because it was not able to unify the e-classes of definitionally equal terms, which just happened to not be syntactically equal. So this is one big chunk of problems which we address in, in our proof tactic now. So we, we build a bridge <laughs> um, between the equality that we have in lean, so definitional equality, and the one that we have in eGraphs, so syntactic equality, by somehow encoding these definitional equality rules into, uh, into egg. And we do this in various different ways. So one approach that we take is for some definitional equalities, we can actually, before equality saturation starts, already pre-generate some equations which encode definitional equality. So for example, for type classes, that's what we do. We say that a application of a type class is equal to kind of just reducing that to its underlying function. Uh, a second kind of class of techniques that we use is normalizing expressions. So for example, Lean's expression language, is, language contains some syntactic constructs which you can just eliminate beforehand. And as a result, uh, those can't lead to syntactic differences in an e-graph. So for example, we do that with let expressions. We just eliminate those beforehand. So the e-graph doesn't have to know that let expressions exist, so that can't lead to syntactic differences. And as a th third example of techniques that we use, and probably the, the most common one, uh, we use a bunch of dynamic rewrites in egg. Uh, so for example, we do beta and eta reduction, and we can't do those just given let's say normal rewrites, we actually need dynamic rewrites. Uh, and I think this is, I'm not too familiar with Egglog right now, but I think that might be one of the things which also would really be missing for us if we used Egglog, because Egg really gives us a lot of flexibility to just play around with terms in a sense at runtime or during equality saturation, uh, which we, yeah, which we just rely on. Okay, so that's kind of the first class of uh, problems that we address, namely definitional equality. And now the second class of problems is uh, that binders and e-graphs are challenging. So, I mean, we've heard at least one talk today by, by Rudy uh, with slotted e-graphs, which kind of addresses this problem. And just to kind of reiterate on why binders and e-graphs really are a problem, um, I want to show you like one sentence, <laughs> which is, I think the underlying problems is that variables, uh, like for lambda abstraction and quantification, uh, variables always require some notion of non-local context. So 
Uh, to see what I mean by that, let's, for example, consider this expression here, where we have like a bound variable, and then we just have some long expression, and the expression is so big that I just kind of like erased some of, some parts of it. And if we consider this expression, and I, and I ask you, are these occurrences of x actually the same? Well, then the answer is syntactically, of course they are, because they're just both a variable called x. But semantically, like we can't tell because there's these ellipses in between which might contain another binder which actually shadows the second occurrence of x. So this is what I mean by we need kind of non-local context. We can't just look at parts of our terms to figure out what a variable means. We always kind of have to know the whole term. And that's kind of counter to how e-graphs work where e-matching just sometimes considers local parts. Uh, and it turns out, yeah, uh, lean uses actually de Brown indices, so we also encode terms using de Brown indices. Uh, and that has still the same problem. So in this case, we don't know whether these two de Brown indices refer to the same variable or not. Okay, and so as a result of this, uh, yeah, this property of variables, we actually run into, I'd say, three classes of problems, of which I'm not gonna talk about all of them. So first there's uh, invalid capturing, which probably most of you are uh, familiar with. Uh, so that occurs when or no, actually, I'm just going to skip that part. <laughs> um, so invalid capturing yeah, is a known problem. The second one I call variable enode aliasing, which is basically exactly the topic of uh, slotted e-graphs. Uh, so if you represent uh, bound variables directly in an e-graph, since they're all going to be syntactically equally, especially when you use the Brown indices, uh, that actually leads to, uh, in a sense, what I call aliasing of enodes here in the e-graph. So for example, we have two expressions here, and the left one contains a bound variable x, and the right one contains a bound variable x. But in the e-graph, where this would be represented using the de Brown index, index zero, they both have to point to the same enode because you can't have multiple, or the same enode in different e-classes. And this then has the effect that if we start doing rewrites which involve this bound variable, and for example, if other terms are added to that E-class, that's actually gonna affect other terms which kind of had nothing to do with that variable, just because that variable has to be shared in the E-graph. So yeah, I think one solution to this problem is precisely slotted E-graphs. Uh, so we've already tried playing around with slotted E-graphs together with uh, Rudy and see if that might fix, fix this problem. Though we have to say in practice, it seems this isn't actually a problem. Uh, so we, I, I haven't encountered a, a proof goal which failed to be proven because of this problem. So perhaps in practice, we can also just ignore it. Now the third class of problems that we get from binders and e-graphs, uh, which I find the most interesting because I kind of stumbled upon it or wasn't aware of it beforehand, is what I call invalid matching. And if any of you know what this is actually called, please tell me because I, I just don't know what this phenomenon is called. And what I mean by invalid matching is, let's say we start with this term at the very top here, some lambda expression, and we now try to apply this rewrite here on the bottom. Then that's totally gonna work. Like egg is just gonna apply this rewrite, and here I've color coded um, which parts would match against which pattern variables. And so notably you can, for example, see this pattern variable E appears twice here, and it just matches against these two variables x because they match syntactically. But you might notice something, namely those two variables x are actually different variables, right? One of them is actually kind of the orange one, the other one is the red one, but now they've both matched against the same pattern variable. So apparently something is wrong here, uh, namely while the syntax, while we matched correctly syntactically, uh, we actually kind of invalidly matched when it comes to semantics. And so this is, uh, this is one case of how invalid matching can occur, and there's actually another, uh, another set of criteria which can lead to invalid matching. And the way we solve this actually is very simple. So again, dynamic rewrites help us with this. Um, we just turn every rewrite into a, or into a conditional rewrite rather, where we just check whether such invalid matching has occurred, and we can check that kind of locally. And so if that occurs, we just uh, don't perform the rewrite. Okay. So, one more minute, okay. Yeah, I think that should work. So, uh, these are kind of the two big classes of problems that we address, and now I have one minute for my sales pitch at the end, um, which is I want to actually convince you that what we've done here is actually worthwhile. 
Uh, so in the beginning, we saw that the way we would prove this theorem that we saw here is by a bunch of small step equational, uh, equational reasoning and using our new fancy proof tactic, which we call egg, <laughs> um, we can actually compact it down to this. So we can say the nil case is proven by these three lemmas and the inductive case is proven by these other four lemmas. How, how it does that, we don't care. We just want to say, obviously, these uh, proof goals hold. And now if we're uh, really cool, we can actually define a macro in lean for this. So we can come up with a kind of new proof tactic called lists here, which just throws all of the, uh, all of the relevant list lemmas into egg. And then we can just rewrite, um, or we can solve our proof goal using this list tactic. And if we're really cool, then we also use tactic combinators, which means we can end up writing it like this. And this is kind of what we want, right? We want to prove this theorem by saying, yeah, by induction on the list, and both cases are obvious if you use the induction hypothesis. So that's actually what we can do now. And we hope that this sort of DIY proof automation, so kind of constructing your own proof tactics uh, from a given set of equations, could be used more generally in Lean. And so now, in the sake of time, here's some relevant links. Uh, and thanks for listening. And thanks for the organizing committee um, for organizing this, uh, this cool workshop. All right, thank you. Uh, we have time for maybe one quick question. You want to go ahead and get set up? Uh, yeah, thank you. Great talk. I, there's a thing called the Barendict convention uh, yeah. okay so it's if you have a closed term yeah. uh, it guarantees that you have chosen unique names for all your binders yeah. it seems like that would help you with some of the invalid matching and uh, invalid capture mm -hmm. yeah that's oh uh, yeah I considered that too though I guess the problem is that brings us back to the problem of trying to represent all bound variables with unique names, which was kind of what was addressed in the slotted egraphs talk. So we don't want to do that, um, which is kind of why we currently just use the Brown indices and just not care about the fact that things might break a little bit. But so I don't know if that's a um, kind of like a long-term solution to the problem. But I, yeah, I was also thinking about just choosing different names would fix it, but we just don't have that luxury in an egraph, I think. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.